Well, joining me now in Boston, Massachusetts, is Eric Caron. He's a former U.S. special agent who had worked in the Department of Homeland Security and with Interpol. And in Tehran is Iranian affairs analyst Said Mustafa Hoshcheshem. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Mustafa Hoshcheshem, let me start with you. So Trump's tweet, if Iran wants to fight, that'll be the official end of Iran. Are you taking the U.S. president's words seriously? Hello, and thanks for having me. Well, good question. As a matter of fact, Donald Trump is trying to raise the stakes, and it's not just the words by Donald Trump. But the United States Army has been making increasingly reckless and risky moves all throughout the last week in the region, in the Persian Gulf, and in Iraq. Uh, that that as uh, you know, uh, these moves have raised uh, uh, you know the risks of an incidental, unwanted war between the two sides. Because one of these days, probably in the long run, uh, I believe uh, it would be uh, uh, surely. Uh, very bad case, and it would start uh, incidental war. Uh, one of them could eventually, you know, lead to a misreading by the Iranian side that's pretty well uh, ready and prepared for uh, giving a crushing second strike to any uh, wrong move by the United States. Uh, what Trump is doing is that he is just going the same uh, way, and he is using the same strategy of engagement for the sake of con uh, containment. Uh, uh, that Obama started, actually, uh, that relies much on the uh, sanctions and other hostile economic moves, uh, as cyber attacks, as well as uh, psychological warfare, alongside posing credible military threat. So Donald Trump thinks that uh, he has not exerted enough pressure and threat to Iran to make uh, Tehran change its calculus and uh, go to talks with the United States, and he hopes that if he convinces Tehran that he is not bluffing about war, then okay. uh, Tehran would change its calculus. But okay. this is a wrong strategy. To wrap it up in one sentence, I should say that irrespective of what Tehran thinks, Tehran is very much resolved not to take part in talks, no matter right. uh, uh, the you know uh, reality of the threat, uh, the threats that are given by uh, Donald Trump. Yeah, Rouhani saying the time is not right to talk, Eric. Who is provoking yes. whom? Is it the Iranians or the Americans? Thanks for having me, Imran. Um, listen, the president sees the threat matrix every day, referencing Iran. And he sees that the Iranians are increasingly acting aggressively in the region. They've been doing this for, for more than a decade. And he understands that Iran is a, is a state sponsor of terror. We know they support Hezbollah. Hamas and other groups in the region. They are actively pursuing nuclear and biological chemical weapons and um, weapons of war, and they're preparing for war. They've been preparing for war for many decades. And so this president's number one priority, Imran, is to keep America safe. He said it, and he needs it, and he will, he will act out if if Keep America safe by going to war with Iran with potentially disastrous consequences. I, you know, I don't, the president is determined not to go to war. I think he wants to get people out of wars, our military out of wars in, in Afghanistan and in Iraq. He's, 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 re, he's bringing down the force level there. He doesn't want to go to war, but he will protect his personnel and protect America. And I, if anything, I would see surgical strikes in the region, um, no boots on the ground, but he will act. Okay, but surgical Italian. strikes where? In Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, everywhere? Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, I do oh. see, I would say, I think Yemen, Yemen, unfortunately, Yemen is, is unfortunately, where's the United Nations? There's 25, what million people starving in Yemen because of the civil war in Yemen. And, you know, Iran is, is supporting the Hutus and, you know, the Emiratis and the Saudis on one side, and it's a, it's a quagmire okay. right okay, now. Okay, let me bring in and Mustafa Hoshchesham. Okay, so uh, Eric, we got some interesting insight into the mindset there. Mustafa Hoshchesham, you've got somebody supporting what the mm -hmm. president's doing here, and He's not saying it's a game of chicken. He's not saying that Trump is bluffing. He's saying Trump is prepared to do what's necessary because 
The Iranians yes. are a real threat. Mustafa Hoshchesim, respond to that. Well, that that's uh, th uh, that's the theater. You know, uh, before providing you with your response, I, I need to say that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, your other guest from Washington claimed that Iran and its allied groups are using biological and nuclear weapons, or uh, they are threatening to do so. It's not bad to remember that uh, Iran has never, ever gone that way. That has been, you know, endorsed by IAEA. The possible military dimension case was, uh, you know, dismissed uh, on the eve of the nuclear talks and the deal between Iran and the world powers. Uh, even the NIE report that comes from 16 U.S. intelligence bodies have stressed that Iran is not going that way. Iran is in full compliance with the nuclear deal still. Still, it's in full compliance. A year after the U.S. discarded that deal, with full disrespect for U.N. Security Council Resolution 2231, and it's uh, regretful to see that other members of the U.N. Security Council let the U.S. go unpunished after violating the resolution. Now, I, I do not mean to battle your other guests' views about terrorism and so on and so forth. I'd rather produce some very vital comments for these days uh, in our region, we are living in re in this region, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and even Saudi Arabia and the UAE. We need to understand the threats uh, present in uh, this region. Uh, we do not believe that Donald Trump is preparing for war, but he is uh, trying to play a, uh, an act uh, that's more probable, uh, that's possibly because uh, that that's the reason why uh, he uh, employed, uh, you know, John Bolton uh, uh, since day one that he called him to office mm -hmm. in order to uh, convince Tehran that this is a copy uh, uh, of the same uh, Iraq invasion in 2003. Okay. And his efforts to s establish a link between Iran and al-Qaeda to make use of the act on use of military force of 2001, these are all done in order to keep Iran under suspension, concerned that about the possibility of an imminent war. But I do repeat this, that these are hazardous uh, uh, gambling that uh, this is a gambling done by Donald Trump because now the risks of incidental war are higher than ever first second he is gambling not out of his own pocket but out of uh, the pocket of the international community because uh, the Strait of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf is the lifeline of oil and energy consumers and the whole world should pay the price for these hawkish policies okay. allegedly uh, they say they are there in order to defend their own interests but right. This is a hawkish and warmongering offensive strategy adopted by Trump done through so-called defensive tactics. Okay, Eric Karen. So Ibrahim. while 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 Bolton might be quite excited about the possibility of conflict, he seems to be the one pushing for it. We've seen and heard the acting defense secretary Patrick Shanahan say that well, the potential of attacks has been put on hold by US countermeasures. Is that really the case, or is the U.S. just now sort of walking it back and dialing it back a little bit now? Because the president had his say, Bolton had his say, and now the acting defense secretary has to make sure that nobody does anything stupid. I, I, I think, you know, you're going to see some push and pull fr from the administration. You're going to see the president, as the commander-in-chief, says, I will take action. His diplomats on the ground will try to resolve this diplomatically because nobody wants war. But we cannot allow this aggressive behavior that we saw in the last week or two from the Iranians in the Straits of Hormuz, in Fajara, where the attacks on the oil tankers, the attacks in the oil fields in Saudi, and these missiles that dropped near the uh, U.S. embassy in Iraq. That's all coming and being led by the Iranian regime. And we're, I'm seeing, I'm hearing information that, that the Iranians are communicating directly with um, Hezbollah and commanding them and telling them to attack U.S. interests. And so if the president is determined to keep us safe and he's telling his diplomats on the ground, hey, work this out as best you can. We do not want war. We want to trade with the Iranian government, but we cannot trade if there's war, if there's conflict in the region. But that's what Barack Obama was trying to do with the JCPOA, right? And Trump pulled out of it. Yeah. 
Obama wanted to trade with the Iranians. Trump came in and said, why are you giving these guys $100 billion? They don't deserve it. Well, that's a, it's an interesting point. Um, I don't, I'm not privy to all the information and intelligence, the updated intelligence that the president's been receiving over the course of the last year. Um, but he made that determination based on the information that he's seen that it wasn't a good idea. That deal was not a good deal. And okay. he, he's, right. keeping, he's keeping the international pressure of right. embargo on the Iranians to try to squeeze them more. And it's, I think it's having an effect. Mustafa Hoshashim, it's not very often that an American audience gets to listen to somebody coming out of Tehran. And this is an international show with an international audience. Before I say goodbye to both of you, Mustafa Hoshashim, what's your message to the American people? Well, first of all, um, last week, Israeli premier had a meeting with his intelligence bodies and chiefs, and they uh, ensured him that Hezbollah missiles have not been pointed at Israel at present. That's why uh, uh, he transferred that to Pompeo. And that's why uh, the Israelis, unlike any other time, they are not raising, uh, uh, they are not trying to escalate the tensions by uh, posing threat to Tehran. Uh, the message here is that the Europeans are also going a wrong way by threatening Tehran. They want to raise the price for their mere verbal political support by threatening, I mean, at least Britain is doing so, by threatening to join uh, the United States. They should understand that Iran has changed this, its strategy. Tehran's new strategy that started uh, a couple of months ago entails uh, incurring costs through reciprocal moves uh, to anyone that takes hostile action against Iran, and not just in the military field, but also towards the Europeans that have remained inactive and indifferent to their obligations under the nuclear deal. So they need to make sure that uh, what Iran has said about modifying its JCPOA undertakings, these are not just uh, some separate, you know, reactions uh, they, they are only a very small part of Iran's new strategy. Iran is not going to initiate war, but something that Americans have to understand is this. Tehran uh, sees the situation as such. Either there is no war or there will be full-scale war. Any limited action, surgical operation or one single strike on Iranian army, IRGC, or uh, tankers or vessels anywhere in the world would be reciprocated with a maximum power uh, uh, crushing right. response. And they need to understand that they may not change Tehran's strategy and they should wait, both Europe and the U.S. They should wait for, uh, you know, Tehran's reciprocal moves uh, to incur costs on them. And Iran has a variety of instruments okay. and options to do so. One is only the military option. There are many other options available to Tehran. Okay. Mustafa Hoshesham and Eric Karen, good to have you on the program. Let's broaden out the discussion now and bring in three new guests. In Washington, D.C. is retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. He's a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, and he served in Iraq during the war. Also in the U.S. Capitol is Iranian-American journalist Negar Murtazavi. And in Berlin is Ali Fatullah Nejad. He's a visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. Good to have you all on the program. General Kimmet, as we heard from Mustafa Hoshchesham, he said, from the Iranian perspective, either there's no war or there's a full-scale war. One such full-scale war that we saw in 2003 was the war in Iraq. Are we seeing similar echoes now to what we saw in the build-up to the war with Iraq? Well, I, I really don't. I mean, I think what you're seeing for the last few days here in Washington, D.C., is significant congressional concern about uh, the administration policy. I think, unlike 2003, the United States Congress will be a significant check on any ambition that John Bolton has with regards to his policies towards Iran. Uh, it's often said that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. I am seeing some rhyming aspects to this, but in general, I don't see this as very, very close to what happened, nor do I expect the same outcome as happened in 2003. Negar, is this a game of chicken? Well, I think there are some parallels to 2003. First of all, John Bolton is back in power, and he's been laser-focused on this um, attacking or regime change policy in Iran. This is still his goal. 
although it's not the president's goal. And also, um, we we hear all this talk, like your previous guest was saying, of Iran trying to pursue nuclear weapons, which is incorrect. Um, the talk of trying to connect Iran to Al Qaeda, which is also incorrect. And also, this type of uh, discussion of the intelligence or a misrepresentation of the intelligence that seems to be happening again by the administration, which was similar to what happened in 2003. I don't think President Trump wants a war with Iran, even if military conflict. He doesn't want that. He's just trying to use the strategy to pressure the Iranians, to bring them back to the t negotiating table, as he said, and then get a new, better deal, what he called it, with the Iranians. But I just think this is not the type of strategy that would work on the Iranians. He's tried it on North Korea. He thinks it would work on the Iranian leaders. It's a very different situation. They're very different leaders. They have very different outlook on the U.S. and on the world. And I just don't see the strategy going the direction that the president wants. Okay. And Ali Fatullah Najad, in which direction will it go? Well, that's a good question. What we've seen this month is a game of brinkmanship between the U.S. and Iranian side. So both sides try to uh, signal to the other side the heavy costs of a potential military confrontation. While I would still argue that uh, both sides, and it's also uh, you know, pointed out by their respective leaders, are not interested in a large-scale military confrontation, there might be a hard nine elements uh, in both capitals who might see uh, that a small-scale kind of military confrontation might be, uh, you know, might be uh, good for them. So uh, what, we read, uh, what we need uh, right now is a lot of restraints from all sides concerned after uh, you know, both sides have actually put their cards uh, uh, in terms of what the actual cost of a real military confrontation would be on the table by various moves uh, over the past few days and p past few weeks. General Kermit, as someone who was in the system, when the State Department orders a number of its, quote, non-emergency personnel in Iraq to leave the country, would that be based on a tangible threat? Or is there a possibility that this is just part of the symbolism and the game playing that's going on? Well, I, I just got back from Iraq two days ago. I was in Baghdad when that was announced. I think a better characterization of what happened there is that they were lightening the load inside the embassy so that if, in fact, an actual evacuation needed to come about because of the types of activities that we saw uh, either sponsored by or supported by Iran, such as the rocket strike that happened, uh, I think they realized that they needed to get rid of about half of those people so that they could actually conduct an evacuation in extremis quickly if it came to that. I would not misread too much into that uh, ordered departure. Does it seem natural, Ali, that the Iranians would look at Hashdashabi and some of their other assets, if you like, in the region as potential tools to attack the Americans if the Americans are threatening them? Well, absolutely, but this is in line with the Iranian defense strategy, the deterrent strategy. So uh, it's clear that what we have heard from Tehran over the past few days has been a lot of threats that Iran might activate all those regional proxies it has against U.S. interests in the event of a war. So I think this is, uh, you know, business as usual in terms of uh, a kind of psychological warfare. But of course, if things uh, do escalate, uh, we'll see a region uh, on fire. But I think that amid this kind of war of words that we've seen uh, recently, uh, over the past few weeks and uh, you know days as well, we've also seen some kind of signs that some kind of diplomatic outreach might be possible, starting with Foreign Minister Zarif's visit to the United States, where he actually tried to very you know very clearly reach out to President Trump himself, uh, you know operating him out of the rest of the White House and saying that he uh, might not be you know, uh, interested in war and uh, might be interested in, in talking uh, to Tehran. And uh, for Tehran, I think uh, you know, the, the U.S. sanctions will make it uh, almost impossible to exit the deep economic crisis at home. But what, what Iran is trying, by, you know, uh, trying to do right now is to regain the kind of leverage it had years ago by revitalizing parts of its nuclear program so it can engage diplomatically with the United States, not from a position of weakness. But, and but Ali, uh, if, also if we've they, seen uh, that Ali, sorry countries to like Oman have yes, also seen certainly. a lot of diplomatic certainly. activity as yeah, well. Sorry to interrupt you now, and I want to go into the diplomacy in a second, but I want to pick up on something you said there, Ali. The fact that they might want to sort of revive parts of the nuclear program. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're on a path to a weapon, right? 
but that would be a tremendous gift to the Trump administration, wouldn't it? Because Absolutely. they'd say, look, they want nukes. We need to go and take them out immediately. This is an imminent threat now. Well, I mean, first of all, you're right. We're just talking about low-enriched uranium for now, so it's very far from weapons-grade uranium enrichment. But if Iran continues its kind of strategy, uh, a gradual reactivation of its nuclear program, and uh, with uh, you know the 60-day ultimatum uh, posed on the Europeans to deliver the economic dividends running out, we, we might see more steps in terms of this re-energizing of the nuclear program. Mm -hmm. And at some point, the threshold might be uh, you know uh, crossed so that we might see actually new n nuclear conflict as we had uh, you know a decade ago. And this would be very difficult uh, for Europe in particular because it would m really you know, make it hard to, con to continue the kind of diplomatic and political support that Iran has received so far. Negar, are we ever likely to see the Iranians go, OK, we're in a bit of trouble here, let's dial back our support for Hezbollah, let's dial back our support for Assad and the Houthis and so on because we don't want the Americans to attack us? Or is that an impossibility? I don't think we're going to see that um, in, in full motion anytime soon. These proxies and uh, the leverages that Iran have for the region are specifically for times like this. Of course, the Iranian armed forces are not going to win a one-on-one -on -one against the, um, the, the world's strongest army, the American army, and it's the leverage that Iran has across the region uh, that has made it uh, an, a, a serious threat and, and a considerable threat on, um, on the U.S. But I, I want to also talk about the European side. I think the Iranian moderates have been put in a very difficult situation. They've been waiting for the Europeans for almost a year since President Trump left the deal uh, to deliver on these economic promises and what Tehran has expected for them to compensate basically for the lack of of U.S. Mm -hmm. presence, and the uh, Europeans haven't been able to deliver economically. Politically, they've been very strongly supportive of the deal and even uh, standing against the U.S., but economically they haven't delivered. And now uh, moderates like President Rouhani and his team are put in a difficult situation because they've been waiting around for Europe, as they call it, uh, with these statement therapies, just political statements, but no real action that um, uh, has been seen on the ground in Tehran economically. So I think this was probably the only course of action that Iran could take to try to put some kind of limit uh, or a threat on Europe to deliver on these economic expectations. Yes, the European leaders have said that they want maximum restraint and they've issued the sort of traditional boilerplate condemnations and they don't want trouble and they want peace. General Kimmet, who is capable of mediating between the United States and the Iranians, is it possibly the Iraqis because they have the most to lose when it comes to this? Well, look, the back channel traditionally has been the Omani government, but I see also that the Qataris have been uh, volunteering their services. And as you say, the Iraqis have already made an outreach to both sides. But listen, one thing I think it's important to note, we keep talking about if there's war. What we're really talking about if is if there's a military component to war. The two countries are at war right now. Economic sanctions are a form of warfare. Uh, the diplomatic withdrawal from the JCPOA is a form of warfare. Clearly, these types of programs and what we're seeing in the press is a method to manipulate public opinion, uh, which is a form of warfare. So I think it's important to note that, in fact, one could say these two countries are already at war. Now, what's only being discussed here is whether that war right. is actually going into the combat realm rather than the other realms where it's going on now. Right, and to that point, General Kimmett, has it been reckless of this president to send aircraft carriers to Iran's doorstep, right? Everybody's talking about, oh, well, we don't want an accident to happen. I guess it will be an accident if the U.S. bombs Denmark out of nowhere, but if you've sent an aircraft carrier to a country's doorstep, you have in some way declared war, haven't you? No, uh, let's be very clear. Since 1979, the Carter Doctrine has said that the United States will have an investment in the region. We've been putting aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf uh, since 1979 and beyond. Uh, the fact that it's happening now is, should not be seen as provocative. Uh, and again, on this issue of provocation, uh, I think what's very much in John Bolton's mind is take a look at what happened in 1988 when the Americans started putting the Pershing II missile inside of Europe. That was seen as a tremendously provocative activity, which was going to cause the Soviet Union to, to conduct preemptive strikes. 
That simply didn't happen. And I think that's the calculus that this government is using, is that everybody can wring their hands about provocation, but sober minds on both sides are going to understand the messages that are being sent and are going to take the appropriate action in response to those messages. Ali, do you agree with General Kimmett that it's not quite the provocation that the Iranians take it as? Well, uh, I mostly agree. I also think that uh, there has been a quite a media hype about uh, the uh, military built up by the United States. <coughs> Although, um, you know, one would hope that sober minds on both sides do understand the kind of, you know, steps that is taken by them uh, respectively in this game of brinkmanship, uh, we, cannot, we cannot exclude the possibility of miscalculation. Um, however, uh, I think uh, that uh, we will not see any more uh, kind of games in this kind of brinkmanship and uh, we'll see more, you know, efforts and, uh, you know, the urgency of diplomacy and uh, hopefully we'll move into this direction. Nigar Murtazavi, tell me about some of the conversations that might be happening in Washington right now. Is there a war fever? I think the uh, threat of war inside the Beltway, not among the American public, but inside the Beltway, is taken seriously. But at the same time, I think the Democratic minority is pushing very hard against um, the the John Boltons and the and the administration and the White House. They have been very adamant in. Uh, requiring intelligence and briefing and information that the administration is relying on and they're pushing back against it, coming out with public statements, uh, saying the administration is misrepresenting the, in the intelligence, they are uh, misrepresenting the level of threat from Iran, and uh, I think there's a, there's a serious push and also there was a lesson learned from the invasion of Iraq, both for the media, both for the opposition, the Democrats, and the progressive uh, progressives here in the Washington. And I think they are utilizing those lessons and trying to not repeat uh, what happened in the in the pre-Iraq invasion era. But I think that the the threat of a military conflict is still serious. It could escalate any time very easily accidents can happen in the region and that is understood both in Tehran and in Washington. General Kemet, as somebody who served as a brigadier general, as somebody who was involved in the Iraq war, to those viewers of ours who might be watching in Iran, who believe that the U.S. is hell-bent on invading and destroying their country, what's your message to them? Well, my message is, as your earlier guest said, nobody wants war. Everybody understands the significant uh, cost that it would take and everybody understand the price that would be paid. So I think the important thing for the people in Iran to understand is if a rocket is fired again from East Baghdad into the American embassy compound and 12 or 15 Americans are killed because of that uh, rocket attack, you are inviting the United States of America to use its full force and military might uh, against you. So let's all be cool, let's all be careful, let's make sure our leaders don't do anything provocative. The United States Congress is providing oversight on this president to hold him back, and we would hope to see that same restraint in Iran. Mark Kemet, Ali Fatullah Nejad, and Nigar Murtazavi, good to have you all on the Newsmakers.